Thank you very much for joining me. It is currently, I guess currently, I guess it is currently, but today is November 17th on a Friday afternoon, and this is the time I'm recording this episode. So thank you for taking the time to listen. I'm grateful to be able to spend this next little while with you talking some user experience and marketing and whatever else may end up coming up uh, in the world here. So this is going to be a more of an intriguing time, mainly because I'm trying some different things on this podcast. One thing is, if this is the first time I'm actually going to be, I'm trying to film the podcast, uh, which will then be going up on my YouTube channel uh, after this. So that's one thing that's going to be different. And number two, one another thing we're doing a little different is I'm trying to go off script a little bit today. And what I mean by that is I have no script. <laughs> so... What I'm going to be doing is I've got my, my talking points, uh, but a lot of it is going off the dome. So wish me luck, and uh, hopefully I don't say anything too offensive or, you know, offend, or yeah, anything too offensive or say anything too stupid, because I'm liable to do that from time to time as I do say some really stupid things. So let's try to limit the stupidity, hopefully get some good content going on here, have some great conversation have some good discussion points. And again, if I say anything that you disagree with at all on this podcast, please email me at josh at whatson.com, W-A-T-Z-A-N. Email me, tweet me at j one Udes. Say something. If I say something that you disagree with, I'd love to have some more conversation about things that are discussed here on this podcast, especially when I'm doing it on my own as we're in the search of a new talk, uh, well, not a new talk host, but a someone to come and do this with me. So it's not just me talking to you, uh, just to make it a little more interesting. So wish me luck and try and find that person. But at this point in time, I'm what you got. So we're going to talk off some news points that kind of caught my attention this week. Uh, one thing, especially living in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, is Canada usually is the last country um, to get nice things, I've realized, because we're such a small market. Uh, and living in Halifax... It's 10 times that, that I don't get, we don't get nice things because we're even smaller market of 500,000 people here. So there was something that happened this week I was really uh, excited about. I've been getting, I've been using Amazon Echo in my house, but I've been kind of smuggling it back home through my in-laws so I, I last Christmas I bought an Echo Dot to go in our one bedroom apartment, and which served a lot of use, but you can only do so much because it wasn't supported in Canada yet. And it wasn't too bad. I couldn't complain. I liked it. It was good for a one bedroom apartment. But then we moved into a house, and so I needed some more voice activation, and I ended up buying the new Amazon Echo that just came out, the one that has some cloth exterior to it but as well as i bought another echo dot just to kind of place different at different points throughout the house so my in-laws just came in this week and they brought the i had the i had it delivered to their house and they 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 sent it up to me uh they well they brought it with them on their trip up and i uh, unpacked these bad boys started uh getting them set up and then i realized oh td has an app or has a skill for alexa i'm like interesting Wait a second. CBC has a skill. Okay. Also intriguing. Global has a skill. What? And then I started connecting. Wait, they released in Canada? And I didn't find out through any tech news or any articles whatsoever. It was actually through me trying to set up my Echo and Echo Dots to realize, oh my gosh, Amazon finally launched Alexa in Canada. I looked up the stinking article. Of any, if anyone was talking about this, Toronto Star covered it, and a couple other news outlets here in Canada were talking about it, and I was so pumped about it. And there was a weird coincidence because I got all got my devices on the Wednesday, and the Wednesday is when they launched in Canada. I was like, "Wow, what are the chances?" So I was excited. So I went on the Amazon website, seeing if they're selling any Echoes and Echo Dots, and they're selling. They are selling them for the American price for a limited time in Canadian dollars. So I had to take advantage, uh, and, I, and I bought some through that. So I was super excited about Amazon finally, finally releasing in Canada, especially since Google Home just did a couple months ago. 
I think it's a big move for them. Uh, obviously, Canada in the grand scheme is not that big of a market, but I'm excited that they decided to finally come up here because it's only been over a year uh, or longer that they uh, haven't been here yet. So Google Home came. I was like, it's only a matter of time Alexa makes its way up. And they did. They made it happen. I'm excited. And we'll see how, how long it takes for the, the Apple HomePod to make its way up here as well. But it makes things interesting in the Canadian landscape, in our direct landscape here. Only because, I don't know, I don't know what the word is, but it just, in terms of actually skills that apply to this pro, uh, this context, the Canadian context, I'm really looking forward to. I'm looking forward to being able to order my Domino's pizza through Alexa. I'm looking forward to doing my banking through Alexa, even though I have no idea what actually it's going to be useful for. But I'm also looking forward to just doing different things through a voice assistant that is more than just controlling the lights in my house and things of that nature. So excited they launched up here. So that's a big part in the news, at least for me on a personal level. And I think that is big in the Canadian landscape in terms of the voice assistant industry as that is starting to get picked up more and more. And you marketers out there, UX designers, you guys better get on top of this because it's going to be the next big thing. And it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a good go as people start developing more and more skills here. Second thing I want to talk about is the iPhone 10. As more and more people start getting it in their hands, the criticisms, at least from my perspective, have seemed to be dying and people are starting to actually really like this device. So I was like, sweet, that's awesome. I'm glad that people are starting to like this thing. But I'm still on the side, as I, even though I haven't tried it yet, so I can't say anything. I might be one of those emotional buyers myself. But I just cannot get on top, get on, get behind spending, you know, twelve hundred dollars for this phone. I mean, apparently, apparently, the experience is really nice. It's one of their greatest departures since the original iPhone, from what people are saying. Don't know how far that goes, but people are finally stopped freaking out about it, at least, and actually looking at the device, and people are liking it, enjoying it. So, kudos to Apple. Good job. That's that's an uh, one tooth. Like I mean, it's not really huge news. It's more inter interesting that people are uh, minds are changing as soon as they start getting the device in their hands. You know, a facial recognition. But number three is uh, Facebook doing something different in the landscape as well, where they're going to be streaming forty-seven college basketball games through Facebook Watch. Starting, they started that last night. I believe they actually did that, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, I actually haven't really taken a look at Facebook Watch. Uh, I don't know if it's because like, they must have it launched in Canada. I, I don't know. I've been looking through Facebook trying to get to it, but can't seem to. But it's really interesting that they've, again, this whole idea that social media is starting to take more of a turn uh, in streaming live events and streaming mainly sporting events. Uh, Twitter was doing it. Uh, Facebook's now getting into it. I think it's a big step in the right direction. Uh, and it's... As again, it's social media is disruption at this point in time. I'm curious of how that will continue to erupt and continue to go forward. But you know, money is starting to be allocated elsewhere, uh, and I'm hoping people are starting to get on top of it and realize where the world is going, where the attention is shifting. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, I, ho I look forward to the day where I can start you know, watching my Calgary Flames via Facebook because I'm so sick and tired. Okay, rant time. I'm so sick and tired of the Bells of this world, the Rogers of this world in this country just running a monopoly or a duopoly on us. Absolutely stinking ridiculous. I know that they're loving life right now because, well, they get to make all kinds of money off of us. But man, the fact that all the blackout restrictions, all the different things, hoops you have to jump through to be able to watch a stinking hockey game in this country, especially as a guy who lives on the East Coast but is a Flames fan, I barely get to watch my boys. I wish I could, you know, blame the time, but reality is I can't even, I wish I could blame the time. The time's not the issue. I can't even get the chance to watch my boys unless I go through illegal channels. So, I'm looking forward to the day that social media has more of a disruption in the sporting uh, world than comes to television and things of that nature. Because I really am looking forward to be able to watch my boys on a more consistent basis. As much as they've been kind of causing me to cry as of late. Poor Eddie Lack getting ripped apart. But, yeah. 
So that's what Facebook's on going on doing. I think it's a big uh, step in the right direction and really seeing social media start streaming uh, big sporting events. You know, and having 47 college games is interesting. And the next big step, I think, for that in that direction, I would imagine, is them being able to stream March Madness, which, again, there's a lot of ad dollars there. So I don't know how hard it would be, but it'd be intriguing. So that is it for our, our news uh, updates quote-unquote updates uh, in this podcast. But when we come back, we're going to be talking my experience at the Canucks Conference, the Can UX Conference, and all the things that we got to, I got to learn while being there and the things that talking points I really want to discuss moving forward. All right. We are back. And so very much excited to talk more about my experience over at the CanUX conference that took place in Ottawa a couple weekends ago, which we were able to see a lot of great speakers, a lot of people come forward and discuss user experience, obviously was the focus of the conference. I uh, got to learn a lot uh, in terms of how to better my craft and also got a lot of interesting perspective of different people doing UX design in various disciplines out there, whether it be in the justice system or for NASA or in the accessibility realm. All these other places, it's interesting how people adapt and apply their practice and their expertise uh, to these areas to just make our lives better, essentially, at the end of the day. So those who are watching on YouTube right now, I got myself a beautiful water bottle uh, that has can UX on it or Canucks, however you want to say it. Got my beautiful name tag over here chilling uh they gave us these crazy google bags um with has a bunch of crap in it uh, a bunch of notebooks which i'll I'm looking forward to using and sketching away on it apparently there's a toque in there as well yeah i said it too sorry americans uh, uh a winter hat i believe is what you call it i'm just kidding or you guys call it a beanie which i think is stupid but no it's all good i still love you but it was a lot of fun got to meet a lot of people uh, especially a guy like Ryan Rumsey, who runs, uh, who is head of user experience at EA, which I probably still screwed that up. But he was a lot, really fun to talk to. Anyone who's been watching my vlog uh, from that weekend, uh, we had a great little interview one on one time with him, where he was discussing discussing how he applies patience to his work process, and how he can how he does a great job of trying to galvanize and move a whole huge corporation like EA uh, towards having better user experience design. So it was very intriguing being able to have those conversations and talking to those types of people. But the one thing I really wanted to talk about today was the actual, the keynote, the final speech, lecture, whatever you want to call it, of the day or of the weekend was by Jared Spool. And whoever knows out there who Jared Spool is, if you don't know who him, who he is, he's like the grandfather father of user experience design he's an extremely smart man um extremely intelligent and brilliant and really is uh really one of the kind of the forerunners when it comes to ux design and he's uh extremely knowledgeable and uh just honestly just a really well-rounded dude i really appreciated his keynote but what he really wanted to get into was how his, his keynote was a lot about how is what I want to get into the podcast today about is how user experience design is everybody's responsibility, but it's not just, it's hard to just come into a, a company and be like, you all need to be focused on the experience of the user. It's all, but it's about, it's really is a culture that needs to be built within a company, which I completely agreed with, but he had some interesting points, which I really want to get into. He started off with the example of Disney and how Disney just came out uh, not too long ago with the wristband at their amusement parks. And how you can use it to scan, you scan to get onto rides, get into the amusement park, uh, get into your hotel room, and all kinds of different things that you can do with it. And it just kind of made it a very seamless experience for people who are going to the park. So much so as to try and make it an, a, a, an amazing experience as possible, like... You scan your wristband and you get into the park. Disney will find out, you know, based on what you told the system, 
they will send you your favorite Disney character to wish you a happy birthday if it's your birthday that day. Like, that's terrifying and creepy, but also really cool at the same time. The fact that they could go as far as to find out those details to make you feel special and have a great experience at their parks. Regardless what you feel about Disney at this point in time, that is a pretty interesting experience. And the fact, how did they get there, though? Like, it's not just one day they woke up saying, you know what? We should do this. We should just have these crazy wristbands and freak the children out by sending Mickey Mouse after them, wishing them happy birthdays. <laughs> Hello, how are you doing here? It had to start from somewhere. It was There was a genesis of an idea. So he made, he he ended up doing a compare and contrast, which I thought was really cool. So compare and contrast of what they this amazing UX design was, uh, what they, how it functioned, what it, how it worked, but as well as he compared it to where Disney was back in the 90s with their internet uh, experience, where their presence was, and it was absolute garbage. Not because, not even just from a, a site standpoint, because well, all websites in the 90s looked like trash. Space Jam comes to mind, which is still active at spacejam.com, so you know. But it was the fact that they, uh, their booking system through their website was horrendous. It's amazing, obviously, you had two different parks. You had Disney World in Florida, and you have Disneyland in California. And what would happen is, happened time and time again, where people would actually book at the wrong park. So they would book for Disneyland, but then show up at Disney World. And it was actually their system that allowed this to happen. So instead of someone going and fixing the system, what they ended up doing was they actually set aside a cluster of rooms at either park just in case somebody came expecting to have reservations there and didn't have them, they had this cluster of rooms that they could go to. And so what would happen is they would, you know, what say, say for example, it's like 100 rooms that they, they set aside. They never rent them out. In dire circumstances, if they're overbooked, they will never rent any of these out just in case these types of people come. So imagine the amount of money they're losing out on, right? Especially from a marketing standpoint. Uh, when you that's your goal is to try and, and make make some dollars for the homies. How much money you're losing? Which how much money would have it costed just to fix the issue in the first place on the website? The fact that that you, your website was allowing for this flaw to happen for these people to make this type of mistake is costing you hundreds, thousands, millions of dollars every year because you have to set aside these rooms that you could easily rent out but you're not doing it because you have an issue on your website that you want to address this way in a very lazy way, to be honest, and not in a way that would actually help your user not feel stupid, for example. And then as well as um, to save you some money and to be able to, to make money as well. So that was the example he came out with in Disney. So how did Disney go from a trashy website that kept screwing things up to now being such a well-rounded corporation when it comes to user experience design. Like, where does that come from? And so he was making the exact point that it started with a designer who then kind of almost in such a way evangelizes the company. It makes people champions for UX design. So it starts with him or them. And then they kind of talk uh, and help people understand design principles throughout. And to the point, it just keeps going and going by osmosis that the rest of the company then would kind of have an understanding of what it means to design for user experience. And eventually it starts becoming everybody's responsibility for the user of the product to have a good experience. Again, I am very much streamlining the whole talk right now. Uh, it, was a, <laughs> it was an hour talk. I'm streamlining into you know uh, a two minute portion, so I could definitely be off on details and things of that nature. And by might, I definitely am. But that was kind of what happened, and that's where Disney was at, and that's how kind of a design thinking in a company can really start. And that was kind of what he started going off about. Was was that was kind of what Disney ended up doing? Was they hired a designer who 
not only focused on design, but also helped other people understand how design worked. And then those people, that kind of travels up the chain to such a point that everybody who comes in contact with a product makes sure that the user experience is good. From the designer, to the devs, to the product owners, to the product managers, all the way up. It's actually on everybody's mind for the user experience to be good. Because what happens too much in our society at this point in time, especially in our industry, a lot of people tend not to care about the user experience. They came, they, they care more about their experience. For example, the whole thing with the setting aside rooms at Disney. I'm, it would save more money in a, in a, uh, it would have solved a lot more issues if they just dealt with the UX issue on the website. But it may have been too much work to go try to find a designer, to go and try to get somebody to try and fix it, and then talk through solutions and try to get it done. It was easier just to tell management at a hotel, hey, to set aside these rooms, never book these out. That was essentially what happens, is to the people tend to go the path of least resistance, which is a problem, and a problem for your users, a problem for your market, a problem for your customers. Because you will feel it in your pocketbook eventually when your users or your customers are not feeling valued or cared for when they experience your product. They, quite frankly, don't care about you. So if you don't care about them, they will not care about you. Respect is, uh, is earned, not just given. So that's kind of what ends up happening here when it comes to the user experience is people care more about their experience as they're trying to produce a product rather than what is the experience of the user. I'm going to go that extra mile to make it that much better, to make it that much more usable, and have that type of focus. Which I thought that was all very interesting, and I completely agreed with. Even here at What's On, we can get really caught up in that ourselves. I know for me... When it comes to designing screens or designing iterations or designing certain user journeys, I want to cut corners on certain screens. I want to cut corners on how something should look or how something is used and really try to just, hey, let's just throw that button in there rather than, hey, let's think through where this button needs to go. Why should it be there? What's going to help the user to understand what we're trying to to do for them because essentially I love our products. I love what we do as a company. I really believe in what we do as a company in terms of helping, at least with our Feedcast product, helping doctors find relevant information that will help them in their practice. I sincerely believe in what we do. I just need to do my best to make sure that I make it easy on them to use our product. If I don't make it easy on them, then it's absolutely useless. And that's just me talking as a designer. So I got to get my stuff together, really get focused and not be lazy when it comes down to it. But secondly, I need to make sure that is, I, I shift that idea. I shift that type of culture to our developers. Because even our developers, I love them to death, but they struggle with the same things I struggle with at times. Ah, it's just easier to code it this way rather than going the extra mile to make sure that the experience goes exactly the way it needs to go. Instead of, hey, I'm going to cut some corners. We don't need to actually do this experience. We're just going to code it this way because it's just easier to code that way. Even though it's completely possible to do it the way you designed, we're going to do a different way because it's easier from a coding perspective. We're all guilty of it. Even as far as our CEO, everyone, your CEO, your boss, your developers, your marketers, your designers, and let's talk about marketers. What are you doing to make the experience better for your consumers? What are you doing to help them enjoy your product, to make it a pleasure? You never want to have customers that just shop around for the best price. Apple's a great example of that. I could easily go get myself a Google phone right now that is much cheaper than in the iPhone 10. 
but they've built a good experience in terms of customer experience. When it comes to their marketing, making their customers, their consumers feel good about the products they're using, that they they will actually, in their right mind, spend $1,300 on a phone. I'm not bitter at all about that. But that's the point being made here. How much effort are you putting into the customer experience? Marketers. I'm done talking about I'm talking about marketers right now. What are you doing? Are you just being sleazy to try and get your sales? To try and get your numbers up? To try and get your you know, your vanity numbers up? Or are you actually really thinking through how you're helping your consumer? Are you more focused again, it goes back to my last podcast. Are you more focused on what a banner ad's doing for you? Because it's easier? Or are you focused on trying to get some content that's relevant to your user? Or let's, let's step away from banner ads for a second. Something that Kyle Racky shared about in a book he was reading. Where a company, a cafe, stopped using ice cubes in their iced coffee. They began freezing coffee and used that as their ice cubes. So that the flavor would not get watered down, but it would actually get rich, more rich, as the ice cubes melt or the coffee cubes melt. It's everybody's responsibility to have a good user experience. It's everyone's responsibility, and it helps everybody at the end of the day. It helps your user. It helps your bottom line. It helps the money coming in. It helps your salary look, you know, it starts increasing and likes a little better. It's everybody's responsibility to create a good user experience. But you care more about your experience than your customers. That is the question. And that is a great question that Jared Spool brought up in his 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 uh, keynote at the Connects conference. Ultimately, it does come down to the designer to institute that culture. And but he needs to he needs some cooperation help from the boss the people that oversee him or her to be able to do some great work. And to have a product that people are dying to use, are sleeping on the streets in lines overnights or weeks for your product because they want it so bad. It's the careful details that matter. How can you make every touch point of your product a pleasure to use. That's user experience. Marketing. You need to work with your designers to make the best user experience. Another example that Jared used, which I thought was really cool, was Honeywell thermostats. They came out with an awesome thermostat in 1953, the T86 thermostat. It was a big, gold, round, beautiful thing. Easily, you know, you could change it, adjust it, which people hadn't seen anything like that at that time. It was definitely, it, it broke the ice in a lot of ways. It shattered some ground. It shook some trees. And over time, they never really iterated on it. So what happened at the end of the day, they were focused on a function of it. The function worked. People liked it. I like adjusting the temperature in my house, and it's fairly easy to do. But you can't just have one product and just leave it. Which, as much as I wish that we could do that, it can't happen. Just look at Facebook. How much they've changed since their inception in 2004. It's now 2017. How much Facebook has changed and iterated and pushed forward to give their users what they want. So Honeywell did this. They kind of had this functional thermostat that they pretty much had they had the market they had a good chunk of it people loved honeywell products when it came to thermostats and so over time people started wanting more programmable sorry programmable oh my gosh 
programmable solutions. So Honeywell started doing them. And the problem about it is the thermostats that we you're able to program, no one used it to program. They just used it as another thermostat, just like you would the big gold round thing. Why? It's because the UX sucked. It was hard to use. It, you, no one could figure out how the heck to program things for their house. It was too difficult. And so people just kind of you know, didn't really care about it. You know, Honeywell kind of still had the, the market, but they weren't putting thought into the user experience of how someone would use a thermostat to program for certain days of the week. But then guess what happened? There's another thermostat company that came about and grabbed a huge chunk of the market. Yes, I'm talking about Nest. Nest came and offered something no one had offered yet. They're offering a Wi-Fi solution to their product. And it was almost like a it was a nice shot back to what the old Honeywell thermostat looked like. It was a nice cylinder circle that could easily turn and change temperature and you could easily program uh you could control it with your phone if, if you're away nest was the first one to that what happened to honeywell why were they not the first ones because they didn't have a design culture is the argument that jared made in his speech and i i agree so you look at the founders of Nest. They came, some of them came from Apple. Which is a company that knows very well of every touch point of a user experience. So that's what they did. They put that into practice. And they focused on not just the function of the product, but how does it, how is the experience of using it? Is it a delight to use? So there always comes a time in a product life cycle, not just a product, a market life cycle, where the market starts with a very functional thing that everyone wants. It's very functional, it works. People are happy about that. But slowly the scale moves to, it's not just about having a function, uh, a functional thing, a functional product, but it needs to be a delight to use. It needs to have a good user experience, and that's what makes products last and go higher. And that's what ended up happening between Honeywell and Nest. Is Nest was offering such a delightful product. And Nest was had these huge brutes of programmable thermostats that no one could use. So it's funny how Nest started kind of taking up a good chunk of the market. It's a fascinating case study to really think about. And again, user experience is so important. It brings us back to that point. Nest took over a good chunk of the market because of their focus on the user of human-centered design. The person mattered more to them than themselves. That was the key. So I go on to go off and, f and finish off this podcast talking about how UX teams, designers, need to work with the marketing teams to really create a great experience, a great time, something of use for the user. I've seen a lot in different companies where marketing is stepping on the designer's shoes or designer's toes, and the designer is stepping on the marketing toes in the reality, there should be no silos there. When it comes to UX design and marketing, obviously UX design is the whole thing. It's the customer experience. But I'm right now I'm going to talk specifically to the design of a product. From the first touch point of a user, all the way through them using it, and then going back through that cycle again. How does a user find your stuff? Through marketing through messaging. 
So that messaging, that work, that first touch point of a potential user or customer needs to be, well, you're going to hate me for this, electrifying. It needs to be something memorable. Because that's the reality of the, of the day. When it comes to speeches, when it comes to things people are talking about, when it comes to big motivational people, no one actually remembers what this person said in their speech. Very rarely will they ever remember what we actually said that moved them. They only ever remember how that speaker made them feel. It's the same thing in product design. It's the same thing to user experiences on it. The whole thing, when it comes to your product, how are you making your user feel? That's what they remember. That's what they come back for. They are, remember how, it, how you made them feel. So marketers, is your messaging consistent with serving the customer? Are you making it clear what you're solving for them? You know, I have to go off of what Gary Vee talks about. A lot of companies are, would be against this, of course. But the, the 49-51 rule. I will always give 51%. I always give more than I give, than I give or than I take. And he truly believes that doing that will yield in more customers, more traffic, which I also tend to agree with. So are you giving more than you're taking from your customers? If not, why? Why are you focusing more on yourself than your user? And I'm not even going to get into, you know, social and all that jazz, but I'm just talking about in general. If you care more about your user, you're going to see more profit. I'm just saying. You're going to see it in return. So your messaging, how you're getting across your user, are you making a difference? Are you showing what you're going to serve them with? Are you showing, are you making it clear how you're going to help them? Or are you just trying to get a quick sale? Everyone senses when you're trying to get a quick sale, you sleazeball. If you care about their needs, if you, if you truly believe in your product that you're going to actually help somebody with something, make sure that's coming across in your marketing. But user designer, user experience designers need to be in those conversations. They need to be having those talks. You need to be working together to make sure that that first touch point is memorable. So that, say, the messaging, say, the marketer does their job. The messaging is just, it's memorable. It's awesome. It's encouraging. It's empowering. I want to use your product. Then they get to the product. And the expectations are let down. The messaging was great. But the product absolutely sucked. Well, you're not going to get that user back. You're, gonna, you're not going to get that customer back. Very slim would you get them back. So again, the marketer needs to do their job. But the UX also needs to support that. Make sure your product is everything that you're touting it to be. And again, bringing back to the point that marketing and user experience design needs to come together. They cannot work in silos. If you want to do well for your company, do something for your customer. Do something for your user. Work together. Don't let egos get in the way. Don't let how people view you get in the way. Just focus on what. how is this going to empower a user? How is this going to help our future user? You, use that UX design, marketing. You need to work together. Marketers need to think in a user experience design fashion. You need to always be thinking about the user. Always be thinking about how we can make their lives better. And I keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. I've probably been saying the same thing for the past 10 minutes of this podcast.
but it's true. And that's the reality. UX and marketing work together. Because like Disney. When that's your culture. People will remember that. People will remember how they feel using your service. And they'll keep coming back. Like Nest. It's a pleasure to use. It's fun to use. Easily programmable. People keep coming back and using it. And will buy it again when they need another one. All these things are crucial. Focusing from point A to point all the way Z, if that's the point, if that's what the, the process that you're going through. From the first point someone touches you with your marketing messaging, all the way through the end point of using your, your service. Are you making it a delight? And I know I'm probably preaching to the choir, I know for myself right now, I'm saying all this, but it's even a struggle here within our, within our company. It's not something you're going to figure out overnight because people are people. You're going to work with different personalities, but it's all about trying to figure out how to get everyone on the same page of what's important, the company values, the company goals. It's never going to be perfect. It's always going to be a work in progress. But are you working towards making a better user experience? Are you working towards how to focus on the user? Or are you just working towards a bottom line? Are you just working towards the next piece of crap you can sell? I'll leave you with that question. Thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. Thank you for letting me rant for the past 40 minutes or so. You are all awesome. I appreciate, I honestly really appreciate your time to listen to the podcast. Again, if you have any feedback, let me know. If there's anything I could do better, anything you want to hear more of, less of, whatever. I really wanted to try and make this the best podcast possible. And also just make this a thing that people can rely upon um, to get some, you know, just some interesting insights at the very least. It's been a fun journey so far. So thank you for joining me on this episode. Have yourself a good day, a good night, a good job, a good workout. And when I say job, I'm talking about, yeah, you better be listening to this while you're working. Have a good run or whatever it is you're doing at this time. Have yourself a good one. See you later.